Back in 2020, but especially early 2021, I kept hearing Jujutsu Kaisen this and Jujutsu Kaisen that. Even one of my close friends just wouldn't stop pestering me about it. Then I was browsing through Twitter and saw this scene. So Keiichiro Watanabe isn't a man that needs an introduction, but you know since the names of the staff that actually make anime are largely unknown by your average fan, he, he kinda does. Watanabe entered the industry back in 2012 debuting as a key animator on Naruto Shippuden. It's nothing flashy, but still noteworthy that someone so fresh had made his way over to one of the biggest animes at the time. Then a couple of years later, he landed on the insane Sakuga Fest that was Space Dandy and did a lot of work. And it was kind of flashy. Already his work was showing a stylistic work that would be a defining feature in time. And that was his quick bursts of speed to actions with often dense layouts and some equally complex background animation mixed in. Keep in mind, he had been a key animator for just a bit over a year and was producing stuff like this. Anyway, like many of Space Dandy's staff, he would find his way onto One Punch Man and then other great shows like Mob Psycho, and even on shows packed with the best of the best every time he would stand out. And not like in a bad way at all, but simply how unique his approach was. Like even when a character is literally using a plastic straw as a combat weapon, he manages to make it look as cool as you possibly can. And of course, when it came to Jujutsu Kaisen, he stood out, and let's talk about it today, specifically episode 1. Now firstly the storyboard and animation work perfectly together, somewhat as I discussed in the Hunter Hunter video we looked at the importance of storyboards. The thing is, it doesn't matter how great animation is, if it's paired with a bad or mediocre board, it can work against the animation. Thankfully that fight didn't suffer from that at all, but anyway back to the point I wanted to make. The storyboard was often composed in a way that followed the direction a character was going towards and gave a great sense of flow to the battle, and it's kinda similar here. Notice the direction of Itadori's or, well, Sukuna's arm swing, but more so the direction Gojo disappears in. It's the same way he enters in the next cut, although this time with the camera rotating giving a strong sense of energy, however also momentum. But Gojo's actions then suddenly flip and go in the opposite direction. This provides a strong sense of opposing force in composition. This intentionally breaks the flow, but it's partially what gives power to the hit. At the same time, Watanabe's fast fluid actions keep the momentum going. What's interesting is that the strength of the strike isn't communicated through long limited holds or animated facial expressions, but more so through the composition of the storyboard and, well, Watanabe's animation. Anyways, in Watanabe fashion, there's a cool spin added, and I mean, besides looking cool, the slow motion works in giving a bit of breathing room for the audience. If it was just hit after hit, the scene would be a little harder to take in. Then after all that, there's the big final punch. Besides being great at animating people, if you hadn't noticed already, his style of effects is just as noteworthy. His usual method is to draw stacks of flat, abstract shapes for debris and smoke. In this case, he places the drawings out quite a wide distance from each other. This is a really smart but simple way, again, to show the force behind Gojo's hit. I mean, think about it, pieces of tile like this have a bit of weight to it. So, seeing them fly back in such an erratic motion shows this hit had a lot of power behind it. Again, after he flies back, a brief pause for about 4 seconds, builds the moment up before the next attack, and this time it's Sukuna's turn. And we get another quirk of Watanabe's animation, smears, and deformation. Now, these are definitely the type of shots that the highly intelligent people who make the hilarious Never Pause anime posts on Reddit and Meme.com would just grab up in an instant. That is, if we lived in a timeline, they actually understood how to take screenshots and didn't reuse the same screen cap someone took over a decade ago. But that aside, why do animators turn characters into blobs? 
Well, the direct reason may change from case to case, but broadly speaking, it can be used to give a looser feel to the animation or perhaps more strength. And when in motion, it looks great. In this case, Watanabe is trying to achieve a bit of both. I should also add these types of drawings also seek to mimic film. Due to the standard frame rate, which is also the same as anime, 24 frames per second, and especially the shutter speed, there's often blurring between frames. I mean, try it right now, pull up a film clip and go frame by frame. You can also notice the person can sort of multiply and thus the name multiples, which is another classic animation technique Watanabe uses here. With that aside, the actual punch is kind of interesting. Outside of the clever use of extreme perspective, the camera but also the smoke obscures Gojo. This is a deliberate way to get the audience thinking, uh, what happened to him? It's a subtle hook to keep your attention. Also, little aside, I have to give another shout out to the storyboard. Now, of course, using a first-person perspective isn't uncommon in anime. In this scene, it does the latter, but also takes the point of view from the very objects in said environment. In this example, the glass as the debris falls back down and shatters it. It's a detail that makes you feel sort of part of this environment and everything happening to it. Now, I would also add that Watanabe's unique workflow helps achieve a similar effect, and that's through his use of background animation. It's very much a feature that makes the world around feel alive, but also comes with the downside of being very difficult to pull off for the animator. However, in Watanabe's case, he quite often uses 3D backgrounds to make it all work. And for clarification, Watanabe is the exception to the norm. I've noticed many people, whether in my comment sections at times or others, talk as if newer animation is magically made with the click of a button, or on the opposite end, as if animators in the 90s carved out pictures on stone like cavemen. But in reality, just much like in the 90s or in the current decade, animators still mostly use good old pencil and paper. Now, the use of drawing tablets has definitely increased over the past couple of years, as well as the use of programs such as Blender, but generally pencil and paper is still the go-to. Anyways, one big positive that sets it apart from the traditional method is you can keep the detail of the background. Usually in anime, when there is background animation, it's often simplified because having detailed paintings for every frame or two would be a massive task. But also because most animators aren't painters, nor would they even have the time to add such detail, which is why that's handled by an entirely different department and in most cases, different studios to the main one producing the show. And so often when the background is animated, you might have noticed it stands out. However, Watanabe's use of a 3D environment allows for more of a seamless transition. There's no stark contrast in style between the background and the previous cuts. So yeah, overall, this scene is just another reason why Watanabe is one of the top action animators currently working in the industry. I'm definitely keen to see what he'll do on Chainsaw Man, and I have no doubt he'll be there for the second season of Jujutsu Kaisen. And shout out to our sponsor, Fandom Eon, which have a stack of Jujutsu Kaisen merch and, well, merch for just about all the hype stuff. So jump over there and use the discount code RELICS. It's an easy way to support the channel and get something physically back in the process. Also, a little channel update. Pretty much since the content switchover, I've just been grinding it out. I decided around the same time as well to focus on quality, which is, well, one, why I didn't do two videos every week, but is like also why I changed up my editing style. But now it takes double the time to make videos, so much more work as a result and I've been getting sick more often trying to meet the weekly deadlines. That's why the last two videos my voice sounded maybe a little less enthusiastic and generally I've had time for barely anything. Stuff like drawing which is one of my main passions I've had to kind of put aside. Like it was to the point I would be lucky to get an hour done over the whole week and there are a lot of other hobbies I've just had to put on hold so I've decided to do a video every two weeks unless it's news related or the video just is simply short so it takes less time but yeah generally it's just so i can have a bit of extra time to myself maybe i could have a day off every week that would be cool but also it can give me time to make the content better i really want to continue to try new things like in this one and that extra bit of time will certainly help but yeah that's all i had to say and now that we are wrapping things up thank you to my patrons please check it out to keep the channel going and with that thank you for watching and i'll see you later